there's a moment when everything else disappears into silence. fantastic guest now um i'm a big advocate of boxing training sports simply because i think it's good for your body i think it's good for your mind i think it's good for your sort of outlook on life i think training but specifically fighting and boxing in a controlled environment is kind of a bit of a metaphor for life mm -hmm. and my next guest uh Ru Ruxana Begum that's right <laughs> um <laughs> I had to practice that a few times um is is definitely you know um uh, one of those fighters and someone who's got that winning instincts not just in the ring but outside of the ring so the conversation we're going to have today is about your fight to get into the ring because I know you had a lot of battles um from family members and, and your past which was kind of you know in a roundabout way being the most respectful way mm. holding you back then you got into the ring had to have fights you know you become yeah. champion um and then also you've you've got other business ventures so mm -hmm. i want to talk about that um so where do we where do we begin um i i got to know you and your profile mm. through one of the other businesses that i'm affiliated with which is called mimboso which is a wellness yes. app and one of my good friends who's my business partner on that is Ruben Tabares. And he's had so many great people that he's trained, uh, world champions from, you know, uh, people in music like Tiny Temper to footballers to whoever, you know, he's, he's a great guy. And I've, I've seen you on these stories train, train before. And I was always quite intrigued because if I'm being totally honest, there is not many there is now, but there wasn't many fighters a few years ago who were female that were making a mark. And obviously you, you've been one of the, 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 those in, individuals. So um, boxing, how did you get into boxing? Why did you start boxing? Great question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, I honestly loved our conversation. Even last time I felt like we connected it on so many dimensions and we spoke about life, we spoke about boxing, we spoke about the you know what it takes the journey you're on to become what you have aspired to be um so it was such a stimulating conversation that i had to come back again mm -hmm. so thank you for making the time absolute pleasure um i guess my journey in terms of transitioning into boxing started when i became a world champion in muay thai which i um practiced for approximately 12 to 15 years and I absolutely fell in love with the martial art growing up watching Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali. I was just a magnet to those kind of, um, you know, combat sport. And I knew it was out of the question for me being an Asian, Muslim, female, petite, ethnic minority to walk in to a gym in those times and say, I want to be a fighter. So there's so many obstacles on so many levels that I had to bridge the gap. You know, I, I never believed in being rebellious, but I needed to find the, the merge between the both worlds culturally from my background being, you know, being a traditional female uh, raised in Britain, born and raised in Britain, which I'm really proud of. But at the same time, I had my heritage, my roots, my, you know, family values that I had to adhere to. So there was constant conflict, um, the inner conflict going on within me for many, many years. Um, so I trained in secret for approximately five years when I discovered Muay Thai later on when I was around 18 um, in an after school session. Um and throughout my university life, I trained religiously once a week, going to the gym, telling my parents I'm going for a run or just a aerobics class or something that they wouldn't ask too many questions. Um, but my whole life was devoted around that. You know, I was a good daughter. I studied hard, kept my head down. I didn't mess around. I just wanted to do sports. Um, and then, you know, the, the success started coming with the dedication that I started putting into the sport. Um, and then I 
eventually became world champion, I thought, okay, when you climb a mountain, you need to then set your goals a little bit higher. There needs to be another mountain to climb. You can't sit on you know, your achievements for too long because that's how you deteriorate. So for me, what really opened my eyes was the Olympics, you know, with Nicola Adams being one of the first female, um, you know, gold medalists really inspired me. And I thought, you know, I'd love to turn pro. And um, that's what I did. I transitioned into boxing, um, got signed by Mr. David Hay. Um, So grateful for that experience. I learned so much from being uh, such an elite team around me with Ruben, with David Hay, with, you know, Sam and Adam who looked after me with Joe Joyce, uh, not to mention Salah Sisma, one of the best coaches in the world. I absolutely thrived in that environment. Um, but my boxing journey was still transitioning at that time. So I still needed to learn the art of boxing. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of points I wanted to touch on there. Um, and, you know, you, you're very, very passionate about, you know, your journey, the ups and downs. I can. There's a lot of emotion in there, which which I think is, mm-hmm. is really, really good. Stereotypically, right, this is not right, but I think it's the reality. And I think people are coming away from it, but I think we're still kind of in that bit of old mindset, which is, you know, boxing is predominantly – you know, uh, men, men, if some females do get into it, people probably have a mindset of, ah, they might've come from a really rough background Mm. that, you know, deprived and all that kind of stuff. And when you say you're a female, you know, Muslim also, people would have a stereotype that, you know, you're, you know, you're the furthest, (laughs) furthest individual away from being a fighter, let alone a world champion, being being a Muta world champion and now, now a boxer. So to break out that mold, um, was it something in a like organic natural or, or was it someone that said to you, do you know what? You can be more than what the stereotype, you know, what, what most people would say you have to be because mm. again, me being naive, mm. being like a female Muslim yeah. sort of traditional background was your kind of typical family calling just to be a wife and just to be a, a mum and just stay at home or is your background typically slightly different to that? Um, I mean, that's a brilliant question because I think that's what I was conflicted with because the expectations were to just get married, have children and, you know, have a normal job. That is what was seen as success in the eyes of my parents um, and my community and the people around me. So that's all I was constantly being drilled to, you know, pursue, a, you know, a career, then you get married and you have children and that's great. Um, however, I think I was the the driving force in terms of following my passion and my innate desire because I felt that I could do so much more. Yes, I do have a degree and I have worked in the commercial sector, but my love and my passion and the growth and the lessons that I've learned is by far in the boxing arena. Okay. Okay. So I remember last time you shared with us a story about, and I hope you don't mind talking about it again. And um, I normally ask before we start the podcast, is there anything you want to avoid? And I think last time you said to me, you're quite an open book. Yeah. So if we can ex- explore your background again. Um so I know you had you had you got married, mm-hmm. but then obviously that 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 uh, partnership come to to an end quite quickly. Yeah. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Sure. So obviously I, I've come from a very traditional background, um, graduate from university, and the traditional route would be at that point to get married and you know pursue motherhood. <laughs> um, and, and remind me, are you mother now or not? No, 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 okay. no, I'm not. But at that time, that's what was expected of me. You were heading towards that direction. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know any different. You know, this is what everyone in my community were doing. So um, there was a lot of subtle pressure in terms of getting married. My parents introduced me to someone and I thought, mm, I'm sure it's going to take another couple of years for them to find the appropriate candidate for me. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, little did I know the first guy happened to be the one that they really liked and that they wanted, they started, you know, the ball started rolling and I started feeling overwhelmed and a little bit anxious. 
But I have to admit, I was on a 50-50 journey. I didn't know whether I wanted this or didn't want this. So, And for the audience benefit, this was an arranged marriage, yes, yeah? which was, was an arranged Which marriage. is quite typical and normal for yes, your community. Absolutely. You know, this was quite, it was the standard thing at the time. Um, and if I'm going to ask quite a, quite a, a question that, that, you know, this is me just being... I'm intrigued. It's a little bit intrusive, but I just want to ask it. I mean, how do you feel about that now in 2021? Is that still kind of acceptable and normal? Or would you say that things have moved on from that? I honestly think each to their own, you know, I like that some family, families may want to go through that route and others may not. And, you know, I, I don't blame my parents for trying because that's all they knew. That's what they, you know, grew up with. Um, whereas now I think through my experience, they have learned that and evolved with the times and well, thought actually, you know what, you can find someone yourself as long as they're respectful, they're good to you. They, they've become so much more open. And I think sometimes your, your failures teach you the greatest lessons in life. Um, you know, the greatest lessons are through the, the sacrifices you make, um, so I think it's just a personal choice when it comes to finding your partner. You know, a lot of people meet people online, people meet people through an organic um, method. So I think for me now, I've tried that route and I'd rather just meet someone in person now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, I like that answer. Um, so, yeah, talking about the marriage thing, because mm. re recapping last time, I think uh, you felt a bit... There was times of like anxiety, times of depression, maybe times of uncertainty and, and times of you felt that you wasn't living your true identity. You, you, you were being forced into a corner. Mm. Did you ever, was it, was it obsessing at times? Do you feel alienated? It's so interesting because at the time I think I didn't even know myself. So it was a com complete battle and inner conflict within myself. So even though it may appear that I was forced into to a corner. I was still trying to discover my own identity, but I was being told what I should be. And I was trying to fit into a box. Um, and I think, you know, I didn't know any better. I thought that's what was expected of me and expected all my friends and all the people that I knew growing up. Um, so it was a constant battle between you know, being modern, being progressive, being British. Um, and that's how I saw myself. But at the same time, I didn't see anything wrong with having, you know, traditional values. I thought, yeah, that is who I am because I've grown up with those values and I respect myself for those, uh, you know, the, the values that I carry forward. So I couldn't understand how there was so much contrast and conflict between the two identities. Um, and I guess... I was trying to find a balance between the both worlds because I felt like I was living a double life um, and bridge that gap. And that took a long time to arrive to a point where I'm, this is who I am now. Mm. And I know who I am now. Whereas five years ago, 10 years ago, I didn't. And even now, I think I look back in five years times and I'll probably say, well, now I know who I am. You know, five years ago, I, I, maybe I knew 40% of who I am. So you're constantly unraveling and discovering your own true identity and working towards that. Mm. I think uh, the old saying is success is not a destination, it's a journey. And I think equally finding out who you really are is constantly evolving. I think you adapt, you change, you... Um, yeah become different versions of yourself not yeah. completely usually yeah. but you kind of upgrade and you know you, yeah. you you go through a bit of a journey so with the marriage then so like how long did it last for so um i came out of university <laughs> during the summer i got married i think it was a nine month marriage i just felt so trapped i felt so depressed i didn't know who i was in that in that scenario and I ended up going through depression, panic attacks, um, lost my identity completely, um, hospitalized. 
And then I moved back in with my parents and I was able to rebuild myself through the sport. So, yeah, it was a, it was a really dark time for me, very challenging, um, being on antidepressants and, yeah. <laughs> and there was a slightly abuse from, like, your, uh, you know, new adoptive family? I think it's just, you know, there were so many changes in my life at that time because not only do I have a new husband now, I have a new family, new job, new home. What was your job? Um, so I was working um, as a trainee architect at the time. Okay. So I just graduated, started working in a really um, top-end architectural practice. And, um, you know, the job was stressful. So everything in my life was changing. Um, and I was on a high at the time because I thought, yeah, I just graduated. First time in my life, I felt so proud of myself. And then everything kind of just went down from there. Um my confidence was taken away from me. Um, just the emotional abuse, I guess, that was the most challenging aspect of this experience. Um, but I, I guess I look back and I think it was a blessing in disguise because this is what brought me back to the school and allowed me to be transparent with my parents. Um, and they had to see me at my worst to be able to accept me and say, you know what? We don't care that you're doing kickboxing. We don't care. We just want our daughter back. And it took that level of sacrifice for them to be able to take a step back and say, Do you know what? There's worse things in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when you, back then, was you actually training or competing uh, to be Muay Thai kickboxer or was it, was that, was that before your journey going into that sport? Um, so before, I had the breakdown and the, you know, the arranged marriage broke down. I was just doing it out of passion and the sport was very much hidden from my parents. After the breakdown, I honestly, I felt like I lost everything. I lost my health. When you say breakdown, was it like, 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 like almost like a, you went into depressed kind of yeah. mode yeah. almost? Yeah, I didn't know what was going around me. Um, I was just numb. Because I like, you know, I'm, I'm like from a, a world like my with my parents, and it's probably wrong advice now, but it kind of worked for me when I was younger, mm. which was it might be different me being a, being a male as well, yeah. and I'm 35 years of age. I know we're quite actually similar, yeah. similar ages, but my mum, especially my mum, she's very much you know if I used to get upset or if I used to have a down moment, and I didn't. There was no almost, there was almost, there was, but there was no such thing almost as like anxiety or mental health or depression so much. Mm -hmm. There was, but they used to package it different. Yeah. And they used to yeah. say, oh, you're just being soft or you're just being weak. Absolutely. And they, they, yeah. what they would tell me yeah. is, you know, just get on with it. And Absolutely. I actually think that's really good advice for certain people, mm -hmm. but I think it's really bad advice for other people. Um, it's a bit like when you're in the, in the corner mm. of, and you, you're, you're two, two or three rounds in mm. and some coaches will shout and scream at you and that will get you going. Yeah. But some coaches shout and scream at you and actually puts you down. Yeah. You need to work out what the fighter responds to and reacts to. And I think, uh, a psychiatrist or whoever's mm. dealing with your, uh, mental challenges, mm. you know, uh, emotional challenges as well, yeah. needs to know how to bring that out of you. So, yeah. so for me and also the audience, what when when you say you went into like everything crumbled, I know you're talking about the the marriage, but how what's that like going into kind of that that mental kind of hole almost? Um, I mean, it was a really difficult time because there was no um, examples prior to that. You know, I didn't have. You know, I didn't I didn't know of anyone that went into those kind of uh, challenges at the time. So for me, I was just struggling. I was just, I couldn't express myself and articulate how I was feeling to my family or, you know, uh, my in-laws. It was just no one accepted me. Um, everyone had their own set of ideals, but even they didn't know what their expectations were. Mm. So I was just caught between two worlds. Um, and then we just went into a hole. I was, I, I, I wasn't being heard. And eventually I think that 
then led to the physical symptoms of depression and um, panic attacks. And then uh, later on medications where I had to just take some time out to to find myself again. Am I right in saying like you're, and I, look, I don't want to keep on bringing it up, but I want to tell the audience, I'm leading to a better part to this podcast, which is all your successes, but I want to show the people that doesn't matter what your background, doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter your re religious beliefs or even your gender, you can start from here and then get to here if you've got grit, determination and a sheer belief, which you have, and you can translate that into different areas. But sometimes people don't actually realise what you need to go through in order to get there. 100%. And I think I remember your like your mother in law was kind of like quite abusive to you, saying like, you know, you're not you're not good enough for my son or he had he could have chosen anyone, but he, you know, yeah. whatever. You know, was was that was that was that the case? I think it's it's interesting because I think people want to control people or they feel threatened by someone and there's always manipulation tactics and maybe they're not even aware that they're doing that because they feel threatened by you so there's so many dynamics at play um and I just felt broken I felt like my confidence was completely diminished um and I went from such a high to such a low within the space of nine months um I didn't know who I was because before that I was always quite driven I was passionate I was outgoing in a sense that I loved sports um, so I knew who I was. I knew what I liked. Um, and in that year, I just completely diminished every asset. I didn't even know what kind of food I liked by then. Um, and it's because there's so many voices in my head and expectations being told I'm not good enough. Eventually, you start believing that you're not good enough. So the psychological and the emotional emotional. Um, uh, part it played in my life was huge it just broke me completely mm. um and sometimes i i remember i used to say to myself i wish they would give me a bruise that i can prove and show you this is how i'm hurting but i can't i can't show you how mentally abused i feel i can't show you how i'm suffering emotionally um because you can't see that you can't mm. see how someone's abusing you mentally but you you know physically yeah you can mm. so um yeah it was it was a really challenging time for me and it's interesting that I do boxing now or I did combat sport where you're actually physically being hurt <laughs> mm. um I was going to say how did the, 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 those scenarios and the, those lessons serve you to for what you do today whether that's boxing or whether that's going into like different business um opportunities I think the greatest lessons you you learn is through the toughest times. Honestly, you learn to humble yourself. You learn to, you see yourself. And I think that's the biggest discovery in life is yourself and who you become on the journey. And life tests you. And when you're tested, you either rise to challenge or you don't, and when you don't and you plateau, eventually you start dying inside, you lose yourself, and that's a very dangerous place to be. So I think for me, I was able to, you know, after a while, rise to that challenge, um, and it's the greatest feeling ever to be able to, you know what, I conquered that. To be able to conquer your mind, your emotions, is, you know, one of the, you know, the enemy isn't in, in the outside, it's sometimes in the inside and you need to deal with that totally <laughs> totally very very wise words um so moving on from that chapter of your life so what happened to Roxana after you know marriage obviously had a bit of a, a breakdown a bit of a low point in your life mm -hmm. and then knowing you um and, and knowing your profile there must have been a moment which is enough's enough I'm going to move on from this what when when, when did that take place and what happened next I think, I guess, once the breakdown um, in terms of my health and my marriage, I just felt like I had nothing else to lose. So you were about but 20 years of age? I was around 23. 23. So I just finished university, worked for a year, and then I just took myself back to the gym and I thought, you know what? I was a good daughter. I studied hard. I kept my head down. I wasn't dating boys. I was just a good, you know, in a, for my parents, I was a good daughter everything that he had 
wanted in a daughter. So I felt that I did everything right and everything still went wrong. And this is when I just thought, well, I can't play that game anymore. I need to now be who I, you know, who I who I am and who I want to be. So I was trying to find ways of merging the two where I could go to the gym, still be uh, progressive and thinking, thinking, fold thinking and still be a dutiful daughter. So I was trying to bridge the gap between both cultures, the Eastern and the Western. Um, and it took me a long time. There was a lot of inner conflict for many, many years. And now finally I'm at a place where I'm comfortable with my identity and who I've become. Um, but certainly those life lessons, the darkest times in my life has given me the biggest strength and the courage that he, that's led me to the next level. Because every time you overcome something, you gain a huge, different level of confidence, mm. different level of competence. Um, and you take that to the next challenge. And I think that's what life is. It's not, you know, it's not, you can't just sit there and waiting for things. You can't avoid things. You just need to embrace it and take it in your stride. And that's when you feel most fulfilled. And that's when the adventure is. And that's when you're the most alive. <laughs> totally. Um, so I want to talk to you about your, your fighting career. Mm. I find it quite interesting because there has been a lot of, um, first of all, females going into into boxing or combat sports, whether that's MMA, Thai boxing, kickboxing and boxing, which I think is great. I think I mentioned last time as well that um, I had a few amateur fights. Yeah. I still occasionally when I can go down to my old amateur club. Um, one, because I just enjoy it down there. I love training. I love seeing the progression of all the younger kids coming through. Yeah. And also, I like to support them from a um, from like f financially. I have and and also just like just give them encouragement to let them know they're doing really really well mm -hmm. for the community. Um, but when I started, when I was fourteen years of age, there was not one single female down there, and that 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 was like that for many years. I was there until about eighteen years of age. Then I left. Um, Came away from boxing for a little while, got back into it, but I was fighting for a club called Kettles, but I was doing tire boxing for three years. And then I transitioned back to boxing. Yeah. Then I started fighting in the Queensbury League and, and here I am today. But when I went back to Bromley Down and probably about three or four years ago, and I got back in touch with the, the, the coach down there, the first thing I noticed as I walked through those doors, I was like, whoa, there's females here, yep. which was a complete shock. Mm. So, like, why do you think that is? Why do you think females are now moved over to, to boxing and combat sports? Uh, I see. That's such an interesting question because I think the whole culture <clears throat> around fitness has changed. You know, a lot of people don't have to be fighters to to now take up boxing. Yeah. And then that eases the pressure. You don't need to be, you know, you didn't need to have everything figured out. You just take one step at a time. If you start enjoying the sport, then you can then progress it. If you start discovering that you're talented and the coaches are behind you, you know, you want it. once you start walking on a certain road, the road will appear. So, um, and I think with the Olympics, with Nicola Adams being one of the first females, it really inspired the nation and the, the whole culture around sports has changed and fitness and, you know, healthy living. Um, whereas before it was just, you never saw a female in the gym. Um, it was very, very hard to even get a female coach. So there's so many obstacles. Um, but yeah, I think certainly the Olympics helped in 2012, uh, when boxing was first introduced, um, on a competitive level and that gave opportunities. I think that's what it is. Once there's opportunities, you'll start and then you have role models and then people follow, they're inspired. And then, it's, you know, the, the next generation has that. Um, they can see it and then they can be it. Yeah, So definitely. <laughs> and with your journey, why did you start with Thai boxing opposed to boxing? Um, I, th I guess there's different reasons. I, I never saw, if I'm honest, I saw boxing as being quite old school. Um, I just thought it's, a lot of old men training, lots of heavyweights. So it was quite intimidating. I never knew any boxing clubs, but Thai boxing was a little bit more, it had Eastern influences. 
it had a more of a humble beginning. Um, and it was more of an art at the time, in my opinion, you know, growing up. So I saw Bruce Lee and I could see the speed. I could see the sheer skill. I was fascinated by that. Whereas boxing was a little bit more, they go to the boxing gym and then they go to the pub. And that was also against, went against my culture. So I couldn't quite understand how that would fit in my life. Um, so yeah, maybe it was my perspective of boxing at the time and I never saw anyone, you know, apart from Muhammad Ali, that was out of reach, really. Um, I know Bruce Lee's out of reach as well. But there was more media coverage around just martial arts where women could take part. And I think that attracted me to it at the time than boxing itself. It was far more male dominated I would say I can I definitely 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 agree with what you're saying now on the part of humble beginnings and it was a bit more of like a spiritual art yes. like Thai boxing even from the the bands they yeah. wear around their head also yeah. around their arms mm. the chimes where they yeah. do the ritual before they fight so they go to each corner and almost do a dance almost um and when I went to Thailand and went to Bangkok and watched actually watched Thai boxing, um, there was a there was a few very very good fights, and then there was a fight where they started off fairly competitive, but then clearly one of the guys was so much more dominant than, than the other. Yeah. And me being in boxing at the time, um, I was thinking, okay, this guy's going to finish him now. And what happened was he just allowed the, the, the rounds to go by mm. and still dominated, but didn't hurt him. Okay. And I said, to, mm. I said to the guy, I said, how come he didn't finish him off? And he said, do you know what? Where he's a local and he's a local mm. and they clearly knew which one was better after yeah. a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, because they fight for money and that money goes on their family and it puts food on the table. He didn't want to put the other guy, each, to, to take the other guy out so he couldn't find their fucking put food or food on the table. Yeah. And I thought, you know what? That's such a, almost like a beautiful message there. Yeah. And that would never happen in boxing. No. If you was a boxer and someone was getting beaten, mm. you're trained to kill. Yeah. And I, and I get it. I get, you know, trying to get your opponent out of there, trying to hurt them because yeah. yeah. that's what fighters are. Yeah. But at the same time, the more spiritual side of it from yeah. Thai boxing, I, 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 you know, I thought it was quite, like I said, a beautiful, that's, that's the way I'm going to describe it. Like a beautiful it's kind it's of mindset. Isn't it? Mindset. Because yeah. They both knew who the winner was clearly. And he thought, well, let me not sh shame him. Let me carry him through because I'm going to win this fight anyway, but let him feed his family. And it's that whole, you know, idea of it's more than just a sport. It gives people livelihood. It's supporting people. It's a community. It's unifying people. And it's, um, <coughs> yeah, you can't see that in boxing. Boxing is all about ego. <coughs> like you get in and you just do the job and, you know, even if they're on the ground, you want to stand on top of them and, and you know, power them, intimidate them. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's definitely driven by ego, I would say that, definitely. And uh, certainly from the male side of things, it's, it's about the alpha male type, yeah, yeah. you know, stance and things. Yeah, showmanship as well. Which, you know, there's definitely a part a part of that which is great because it makes you want to win it makes you do whatever it takes to win it means that even if you're hurt you come back and you you, you know you fight fire with fire but I think there's obviously a time and place for it and I also learned a lot from that tie boxing match which I witnessed yeah. so okay tie boxing right so yeah. for those that don't know it's not just about punching there is kneeing, mm -hmm. there is elbowing, mm -hmm. and there's also, which people don't realise, is the grappling. So you're feeding your, ha your hands through, yeah, pulling yeah. the neck down and stuff like that. And unlike boxing, you can actually attack by being in the air. So you can do a Superman yeah, punch, yeah, you can yeah, do a flying yeah. knee, you can yeah. do that kind of stuff. You can spin. Boxing, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So in many respects, tar boxing, even though it has a more spiritual side of it, it's actually a bit more of a dangerous sport. I agree. And you can definitely get injured probably mm. far much more worse 
yeah. than boxing because you can e even take down your opponent. You can't attack them on the floor, yeah. but you can sweep their legs and take them away. 100%. I think the injuries in Thai boxing, like the elbows, can cut and they're severe. And I remember there was a time I was uh, training with another female and I elbowed her and my <coughs> the, the guard, the elbow guard, moved and slipped and I cut her eye and she was on the floor bleeding. See, in boxing, yeah, you'll get an eye cut, but you'll see the gradual, you know, the eye swelling up. So you can take, you can make decisions accordingly. But in Thai boxing, it's instant. You know, something just happens. Um, you know, someone broke my ribs a couple of times because all they did was step into a knee. So this, uh, the, the injuries can be uh, brutal. Mm. Um, so yeah and there's a lot more weapons to deal with a lot more things to think about uh, whereas in boxing you're just concentrating on the hands yes the, the skill set is more specific I would agree um, but in Thai boxing because you've got so much more to work with you just need to be that much better at everything yeah <laughs> what do you prefer boxing or Thai boxing I mean, my first love was Thai boxing. I did that for like 15 years. Um, I grew from a little girl to a woman and it gave me so much. The sport taught me so much. Um, but I love the challenge of boxing. I love the fact that every day I'm challenged mentally, physically, emotionally. And I think this is what enhances your life experience and allows you to move on to the next level. Hmm. <laughs> um the other thing I was going to say is, um, I, so I had a bit of a taste for tyre boxing. I wasn't competing as a tyre boxer. I sparred, mm. but I've obviously had uh, a few boxing fights. And what I did, did pros and cons to both. I would say if you're going to start as a blank canvas on both, mm. I think tyre boxing as a fighter, and I really shouldn't promote this, but this is the truth of it. As a, if you're going to fight on the street, the thing that's going to probably help you the most is tie boxing. boxing yes, absolutely. Because you know, you know, you've got different mm. aspects, different elements. It's a bit more raw, isn't it? And yeah. Your body is your weapon to deal with it, whereas boxing can be more seen as a sport. It is. Because it's about timing, it's about rhythm, it's about footwork. Yeah. And you have. Gloves on. But even yeah. if you don't have gloves, it's about the rhythm and the timing. Tire boxing is, but the ranges are far more. The weapons are far more. You just, you, like you said, there's grappling. There's so many aspects to tire boxing that you can actually um, execute in a street fight. Yeah. Then yeah. in boxing, you're far more limited, I would say, yeah. in that sense. But what I prefer about boxing over tire boxing as as a sport is the flair of boxing you know obviously you know you're never going to get kicked you know you're never going to have a grappling match you know you're not going to get a spinning back knee uh, elbow or even a punch or something yeah. like that and they're not going to go airborne and try and hit you with a superman punch mm. so because they are limited there's a bit more flair and there's yeah. a bit more showmanship Absolutely. which which in some ways makes it really really entertaining mm. um which which I really like yeah. so get into be a world champion mm. what how did that feel and like talk us through a short journey how you got there um and the kind of things that you had to go through to become a world champion in that sport wow wow that was a that was a long journey i have to admit i think when i won my british title and then um i was representing great britain for thai boxing and it's almost like the Olympics, you know, you have 160 <coughs> countries competing from all over the world. And these countries are funded, they're supported, they're elite athletes. Um, so I was competing at a very high level, traveling the world. And I remember on one occasion, I went to Latvia for the Europeans. And, um, you know, I was the underdog. I didn't even have my coach there with me. And I came home with a gold medal because I thought I had nothing to lose. But what I demonstrated was willpower and courage. And I just got in there, thought, you know what? They all expect me to lose. Let me just give it my all. And I did that and it was enough. And I think that was my turning point where I realized, hang on a minute, I could be one of the best in the world right now because this is a European tournament. And I've just come home with a gold medal. You know, the, the Latvian Federation came back to greet me and uh, invite me back. And I thought, 
this is remarkable. And that was a that was a turning point in my uh, career when I came back to London and I started believing my own ability. And I realized that a lot of it was mindset. And secondary secondary to that was skill, technique, and the right strategy. Um, but once I accepted it, my my whole it added a whole new dimension to my training. Um, so once I yeah, so from that it just went from strength to strength in my um Thai boxing career. So I went from European, then I fought, got another bronze in the world in Russia. Then I fought for a world title, which I lost. It's prematurely ended. And then the second world title attempt happened, which was a miracle. And I thought I won. Everyone thought I won. And then my, they raised my opponent's hand. Even she was shocked. And I felt really robbed. I felt heartbroken by that experience because I thought I gave it my all. And I knew I had done enough to win. Um, and sometimes poor decisions are made or, you know, subjected to the judges. So you, there's nothing you can do. And from that experience, my coach said something to me and said, never leave it up to the judge's hands. And that was a big lesson to learn because, you know, it was devastating to think you've done all of that and enough and more and you wasn't given the victory. So that, that, that felt a bit sour for me for many years. And then when I finally got the third um, opportunity that came so randomly because I gave up, I thought, to get a first world title attempt is like a miracle. To get a second and the third, I think the title became vacant and um, they needed top five in the world at that time to compete for this. And I, my name got mentioned and I thought, fantastic, I'm up for it. Um, and at that moment, I was diagnosed with ME, uh, chronic fatigue. So I was um, in bed for a whole week leading up to this tournament for this competition and I didn't think I could even get out of the bed. Um, my coach asked me to jump in a cab and then just said, he said, look, let's let the medics pull you out so we're not the bad guys. So I went to the venue and somehow, because I rested and I felt calm, my blood pressure was okay, but I was sweating. I was, you know, in cold, drenched in cold sweat. So I wiped my forehead for that minute and a half. I let the medicals, I passed the medicals, sat in the changing room, couldn't even last a warm up. And then Bill said, you know, I'm scared. I don't want to put you into this in the ring. And I said, give me two minutes. Let me knock her out and we can all go home. That was my strategy. So I said, all right, two minutes. And then if I think you're in danger, I'm going to throw in the town. So I trusted him on that level. So that was, and I said, it's this opportunity is not going to come back again. So I went in there, gave him my all, came back to the corner. And I was absolutely nothing left in my tank. I looked at Bill and he's like, you're winning, you're winning. And I thought, I'm so sorry. He goes, this is what a world title feels like. Wake up now. So the second round, I was like, okay, I need to keep going. Just maintain the pace. I was doing all right. Third round. Fourth round, I couldn't even stand up. There's a moment I see in the video where I'm like, and I could see her coming towards me and I'm like, I can't even pivot because I have nothing. And I thought, I'm just going to have to take this punch and I did. And I took that punch. And then eventually my energy, I started finding different ways of strategizing, maybe getting in closer so I can hold her for a bit and breathe. And then let the referee pull us apart. And then the fifth round, I thought, this is it. She's going to look for a knockout right now. I need to do everything to just survive this round and more. Um, and that's what I did. And it was enough. So it was a... Uh, it was one of the highlights of my career. So and just, I'll never forget it. It was just a grit that got you through. Grit. And belief. Belief. And then I think once you're in that zone, you find the timing. You know, I can see things. It was really interesting because while I was in the ring, I could see things happening even before it happened. And I think because I was so focused, I had to rely on my senses immensely to, to kind of you know, go through the motions, like time was relative. Like I couldn't mm. even hear the bell. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a spectacular moment for me. That is a really, really, really cool <laughs> freaking story, man. Um, so the transition to boxing then. Um, my take on it a little bit, not your story, but like generally speaking, why a lot of people converting over to boxing. Am I right in saying that 
maybe there's a bit more money, there's a bit more endorsements and probably that your profile can get built a bit bigger with boxing. So like David Hay, for example, mm. massive brand, yeah. obviously great guy, yeah. very professional, world champion at cruiserweight and heavyweight. Mm. I mean, the moment you get parts next to that brand, it just pushes your brand up yeah, anyway. Spent. And then if you're, if you're on the match room or... Mm you know, Frank Warren's uh, promotions, yeah. um, that obviously can take your brand from here to here. Mm -hmm. So is, was it was it about that? Like, you know, enhancing your brand, maybe following a bit more money and getting more endorsements or was it just a new challenge? So when I made the decision to um, change over to boxing, I never knew I was going to be aligned with David Hay or, you know, to be on that level. All I knew was actually... If I could do that on my worst day and win a world title, imagine what I could do on my best day. But I had already become a world champion in one sport, so I wasn't hungry for it anymore. So I needed, and I've always, uh, you know, had boxing at the back of my <clears throat> mind, especially when Nicola turned pro. Um, so for me, it was just a new challenge that really intrigued me. And I thought, let me see what I can do in the boxing arena um, and and I remember something my younger brother said to me. He said, you know, like we have Amir Khan who really inspires the, the Asian community and look what he's achieved. But we don't have a female that could really do that. And I thought, oh, my God, am I really going to do this? Am I going to go into boxing? How are my parents going to feel? That's, that was the first thing that went through my mind because I thought they would be so accepting, so understanding with me having a whole life of its own, you know, with the Thai boxing. Uh, and then I thought I could really make a difference. And I've got the skill set. I've got the willpower. I've got the mindset. I have to try at least. And that's what motivated me to transition into boxing. I messaged Sam. Um, and then Sam somehow introduced me to David Hay and said, Rox, who will be the best? Sam name? Jones? Sam Jones, yeah. All oh, right. And you messaged him on um, Instagram? Instagram, yeah. Yeah. And He's actually agreed to come on my podcast. And Sam, if you're bloody listening, mate, because I know you follow me <laughs> on Instagram, please <laughs> book in because I think that would be also an interesting story. But he's a very nice guy and um, I've met Joe Joyce a few times. I know he fought on the weekend and he'd done a really, really good against Takam. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's a great guy. So so your link to David Hay was through Sam, Sam Jones. Jones. Okay. Yeah. So Sam messaged, you know, replied back to me and he's like, yeah, we've got a spot for a girl. And, you know, he believed in me and he said, you've got an immense amount of power. You know what? You could do you know, exciting things in boxing. Um, so, you know, I'm so grateful to them for taking me on and for that experience and for believing me. I just wish I didn't have so many setbacks, but at the same time, it's built my character over yeah. time. Um, and that journey, you know, is still ongoing with the boxing. And Can we talk about now because Absolutely. you've obviously got a fight in two weeks time but when this comes out you would have fought two weeks ago no so how did it go <laughs> no. so it's going to be my first victory so obviously my first boxing fight was a draw um i i thought and my coach Salah Sismo thought i did enough to win unfortunately i got a draw but that's not a bad thing because i you know the first thing i said to Salas was you know what Salas? I'm not unhappy with the result because it, it means I'm not complacent. Um, and even David Hayes said to me, look, sometimes, you know, you see people like George, um, George Grove and people like that who, who don't win the initial battle, but once something yeah. clicks, they, you can still become a world champion. So they were not actually um, disappointed with the outcome of the result. And nor was I. It gave me more momentum and drive to continue my journey. Um, so yeah, so my first, I'm looking to win. I think I'm ready now mentally. And I think before I was fighting out of instinct and Salah said that to me, you've got great instincts, but you, you needed to learn boxing. And I totally agree with him because, you know, the rhythm of boxing is very different to Thai boxing. The range is different. The, the psychology is different and I needed to adapt my style whereas now I feel like I'm there and there and I'm hungry and I believe in myself um 
you know, they always say, you know, when you become a champion, there's always 10,000 hours behind the scenes that no one sees. And I had that in Thai boxing. I had time to grow. Whereas in boxing, I was learning on the job. Um, but I think it's my time now. Good. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to, to, to watching it. So am I right in saying it's in Malta? It's in Malta. It'll be live on Fight Zone. Okay. Who runs Fight Zone? I actually don't know. So so you've got Frank Warren's, which is the Queensbury mm -hmm. promotion. Then you've got, obviously, Eddie Hearn's Matchroom. Yeah. And there's a few new ones which are popping yeah. up. You've yeah. got things like, um, is it Thriller? Fight Thriller? Tr thriller? Which, um, do you know Joe Fournier, who used yeah, to be yeah, down yeah, there? He yeah. just okay. fought. You know the Jake Paul fight? Yay. Yeah, that was on another kind of... Okay. kind of kind of american mm. uh, thing um but yeah i didn't know whether it was linked to something like that or sure it may be but how, so how did you so who's training you now and who are you managed by and how did you get onto that platform okay so i am currently not managed by anyone so i am looking for a manager um so during the lockdown i was training and what happened was i was i contacted um another fema fighter um Maisie who's actually a national champion for Reptum um boxing gym so she came down to spar me and we just got along so well I mean the sparring was amazing it was on another level it was brilliant so first time I was really challenged by another female um and her coach you know we had few different females that came from her gym that were similar weight um to me so they uh, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, visited my gym during the lockdown because they had nowhere to train. So I was, um, uh, you know, we, we were providing them a <laughs> premises. So we had, a, you know, excellent sparring sessions. And from that, it led to Steve becoming my coach to train me for my this upcoming fight. Um, you know, we formed a great relationship and, you know, I really enjoy training with them and he's, he's a great coach training other, um, you know, amazing fighters. Um, I mean, my heart is still with Salas Ismail. I think that man just takes you to another level and it's not just, it's just his aura and he's not only his knowledge and his wisdom, it's his spirituality. Um, so yeah, I, I'm in a place where I want to see what this next fight, you know, what happens with the next fight and then I think I can make more accurate decisions in terms of moving forward but yeah I I, I am pretty much self-managed at the moment okay okay fair enough and um um I asked this to all the fighters mm -hmm. and I've got my own answer to it but as far as physical um capabilities or physical traits that you need to have as a fighter yeah or things you need to do to become a very... I don't possess them, do I? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, I was going to say, what does a fighter need to work on or what is the most important aspect of your training in order to become a top elite fighter? Mm. Um, is it the strength? Um, is it the, you know, the endurance going out on runs? Is it the the speed that you need to do? Is it the durability? Is it the sparring? I mean, what what, you know what? what aspect of it would you say really stands out to make you a good fighter? That's a brilliant question because I think for different athletes, it's different things. Because you look at someone like Derek Chisora, is she a strength? His power wins him the fight. With someone like Lomachenko, it's his footwork, his you know, change of angles, he's overwhelming speed. So you need to discover what it is that makes you, you know, elite in that one specific area, uh, differentiates you and it's going to kill your opponent because it's a, it's a battle of, you know, the minds and to, to dismantle your opponent and different things are going to work with different opponents. So it's not one thing, but if you had to ask one thing that you need to just step into that ring, it's going to be self-belief and um, the love for the sport. You have to love what you do. You need to have self-belief. Um, the work can be done. That's the thing. You know, everyone can train hard. Mm. Um, but you need to have the mindset of not giving up when you're in the ring. So that is going to be the fundamental, I think, as a what will make a good fighter. You've seen journeymen who have walked into the uh, you know ring and destroyed their opponent, and it's simply because they believe that they belong in there. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, it's yeah. you can go against the odds. You know, someone could be funded; they could have the best coaches in the world, but if you don't have the heart, you're gonna you're gonna be unravelled in the ring. Yeah. Um, my mission later on in life, and I've tried to do it on a very, very small and very, very light and passive level, is to try very much so to get in boxing back into schools. Mm. I think there's a misconception that people believe that violent. it's violent and it's and it's and it's for bullies and it's ruthless and it's full of anger. And actually, it's completely the opposite. And it actually, yeah. if you are a bully, it stamps that out of you. You know, mm. if you are an angry person, it gets rid of that anger. If you're um, someone that needs more confidence in life, going into that ring and actually training really hard builds up your confidence. I've got to say, mm. I don't know the answer to this because it's hindsight, but I don't think I might have gone into business for, for myself had I not actually stepped into a boxing environment. Because wow. I think when you go into boxing, it really does build up your um your confidence and you think okay if i can get into a ring and fight a stranger afraid, yeah. what why would i be afraid to set up my own business why would i be afraid of doing this why would i be yeah. afraid of doing that yeah. so what i'm getting to is obviously you know you've been a fighter in different fight um you know arts mm. from boxing to tire boxing etc I think your character and your, your mindset and that trait has led you on to other business things. So I know you're a public speaker. Mm -hmm. you got a book. I think that's been nominated for one of the best books in so, in your in, 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 in your sector. So if you yeah. can tell me a bit more about sure. that. So, I mean, I realised that I my story can really reach out to people from all backgrounds or all walks <clears> of life. And I felt like there's so many universal lessons that could be um, taken from my journey. Um, hence I wanted to write a book and I was told initially my profile isn't big enough. I'm not, you know, I don't have a documentary on me. So several things, but I still believed in my journey. I felt like, no, but this, I've done something quite unique here and imagine how many people I can make a difference, you know, overcoming their me, um, the, the whole arranged marriage, um, there's so many obstacles there that people will be able to relate to the the bullying aspects. Um, it happens in all spheres of life. It's not just in the you know boxing gym. It happens in the office space. It happens in politics, in economics. It happens everywhere. So I felt that I had a story to tell, um, and I plucked up the courage to tell my truth um, and share it with the world. So. I had to believe in myself, just like I, when I believe in myself when I walk into the ring. I know I'm alone, but I have to rely on myself and build that self-courage and esteem. And the only way you build it is by going through the process. Um, and it can be daunting, it can be scary, but it's something that will help you grow as a person. Um, so, yeah, I've written my book and it was nominated Sports Book of the Year by William Hill. It was shortlisted um, also by The Guardian and recently Autobiography of the Year uh, by The Telegraph. It shortlisted some, you know, I'm delighted to be amongst people like Jamie Redknapp, who I really admired growing up watching him play football. So I'm in a really strong category and I'm truly humbled to even make the list. Um, and that people recognise my achievements. Yeah, it's fantastic. What's the name of the book again? It's called Born Fighter. Okay, <laughs> and is it exactly what the title suggests or there's yeah. other aspects to it? I think it's, you know, like I say, it's a universal journey and it really doesn't matter where you come from, what your heritage, what setbacks in life. The success principle and formula is always the same. You know, it's about mm. self-belief, not letting doubts, fears, um, anticipation rule you. It's about conquering yourself and whatever position you're in, you can always make something of yourself if you truly, truly are willing to pay a price. And it's something I read the other day and I, you know, really, you know, it spoke to me and it said, um, there's always a price to pay. And the price of regret weighs heavier than the price of discipline. And I thought... It's so true. It's so true. I'd rather go into the gym every day and pay that price and stay healthy, look well, become a champion. And I'm willing to pay that price 
then sit on my backside. And then five years later, why didn't I become a world champion? Why did I let my fears overwhelm me or, you know, excuses or life circumstances or financial reason? When you truly desire, you will attract the right people, right circumstances to come and join you in your vision, you know, and, and I've seen so many miracles happen. And I really do want to share this because, you know, um, taking up a sport full time and not working could be quite challenging. And I remember I came back from one of my camps and I didn't have a fight lined up and I thought, oh God, I spent all my savings and Salas, my coach at the time, said, go home and pray. And I prayed. The next day I had a call from Adidas. And they said, Roxana, we want you to do this campaign. I thought, yes, camp number two paid for. And a year later, I was like, oh, I really need to, you know, get out there again and train. And Jim Shark really believed in my story, came along, said, Roxana, we're going to pay for your training camps. Go out to Las Vegas. And this is what I'm talking about. Miracles do happen. You know, a girl from East London, you know, came from nothing all of a sudden, face of Adidas. And then Jim Shark are supporting me on my journey. So I really, really appreciate those invaluable moments in my career. Um, and I, I'm a big believer of faith. You know, when you just, that is what faith is. You know, you're not going to see the end product, but you have to believe it and take the step towards it regardless. The old or uh, an example that I've heard before about th faith and about law of attraction and belief and achieving your goals, it's a bit like driving down a very, very dark motorway or even a country road. Mm. You may not know what's around the corner, but you've got to trust in your headlights. It's going to exactly. show you maybe two or three meters ahead, mm. but then it goes dark again. And you've got to trust that the road is yeah. going to unfold in front of you. Absolutely. And sometimes you need to go really quick. Sometimes you need to slow right down. And you feel like you're almost going into reverse. Mm. But if you keep on going forward, yeah. you're going to eventually get there. And, the things, and things are going to open up. And I think... I think we all need to be reminded of that every so often. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what level you, you're at. Yeah. I think if you're a very, very successful flying sports person, billionaire, entrepreneur, you know, advocate of this and that, I think even those people have moments of doubt and moments of disbelief. And I think it's okay, but mm -hmm. recognize that the fundamentals are there. If you yeah. can focus on something and keep on pushing on towards that thing that you want to achieve, mm -hmm. you know, the road will Appear. unfold yeah. in front yeah. of you. And I think that's the beauty of life is that, you know, you miss 100% of the, of the shots that you don't take. So you have to take a leap of faith in any circumstance, whether it's in business. And this is the thing, there's so many transferable skills. When you learn, actually, I've taken a risk and it's paid off, or it hasn't paid off, but at least you know, and then you can make a better decision um, because those things help you grow. Those things teach you something so you can eliminate something uh, from, from your path. Mm. Um, and it's important to be able to recognize failures are your greatest lessons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and the old saying is, it's not failure, it's feedback. And I think it's, it. and it's your interpretation. Exactly. You know, I think, I think, I think taking to extremes, a bit more of a loser's mindset is I've failed, I'm a disappointment, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I'm terrible, I'm this and that, mm -hmm. which is bad self-talk, which is going to yeah. take your circumstances mm -hmm. down another peg or two because mentally I and mean, emotionally you're putting yourself down when something happens to you and it doesn't quite go right okay this is a bit of feedback this is what I needed to adjust yeah. Yeah. and that's a winner's mindset and I think yeah. I think you know there's loads of different self-help books there's loads of personal mm -hmm. development out there and it does come down to mindset all the time yeah. how you interpret things yeah Zig Ziglar, I think, said you can either react or you can respond. Yeah. And I think when you respond, you're in control. When you react, you're out of control. And I get this sensation from you. You typically respond in a professional way. I think it's so important to identify that, you know, if you if you're reacting, you've got some sort of trauma. You've got you need to heal yourself in some form. Um but absolutely, you know, you need to take a step back and look at things from different perspective that empowers you. Because if you see yourself as a failure, you're not empowering yourself. Mm. And that's going to attract more, um, you know, thoughts like that. So you want to keep 
yourself on a high vibration, take yourself into a position where actually, I never saw it from this point of view because you don't actually know if something's good or bad. You may, it may appear to be bad, but a year later you may say, actually, that was the best thing that happened because it led me to this or it allowed me to discover this. Um, you know, I remember there was a fight that I really wanted um, and I was meant to fight under David and Bellew and I had a, I was diagnosed with a concussion. I was devastated because I was so ready for this fight. Um, and I could have had like the sky's balls. I could have had this and I thought, could have been so ahead of in my career. But then I look back and I think, you know what? Maybe it's a good thing it didn't happen because I had to pluck up the courage to spend everything I had, go to Las Vegas on my own <clears throat> as a female, be in a gym and then not know anyone that journey has taught me so much. It's who you become mm. in the journey. And that gave me the courage to do other things in my life. So, you know, I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah. You know, you know success, the word success m means different things to different individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I've got my interpretation of what success is for me. Yeah. I'm getting a bit of a sensation that we've got similar parallels but you've probably got also some different ones <laughs> so my my question to you then is is what is success to Roxana I think success is working towards something that you feel truly passionate and believe in and that you know if you if you have a purpose in life and you wake up every morning excited to do this thing that's success you know, if you're a mother and you're, you know, you're looking after your household and you're excited and you're doing that to the best of your ability, that could be success for you. If, it's, if you're a business person, um, just bringing in a new client could be success. Different things, success is different, it's relative and we can't dictate to different people what success is. But ultimately, I think success is when you can go to bed at night feeling pleased with the lifestyle that you live and feeling pleased with the person that you are. Um, you know, it's not about the destination. It's about looking yourself in the eye and saying, I'm proud of myself today. I've had a great day. Yeah. And tomorrow's going to be even better. For me, that is success because I don't really, I'm not driven by money. I'm not driven by material. You know, we all like to have nice things. Um, but what is the ultimate goal? You know, what does it profit? So if you lose, you know, if you gain the world and lose your soul, for me, it's about that. It's mm. about me loving myself. And that for me is success. Yeah. I think I definitely resonate with <laughs> my, most of uh, most of what you just said there. Um, so you seem like you're super busy. You've got the, got the fight coming up. And again, if you're listening to this right now, she would have, you know, Roxana would have won the fight. Yay! Um, obviously you've got the book, yep. public speaking. I mean, you've also got a really good profile on social media, like Instagram and stuff. Um, what, what is your, like your, your goals over the next sort of few months, few years, and maybe even longer than that, like 10 years from now? Cause you know, you're still young. Um, mm -hmm. is there like a family you do want to start? Um, are you thinking about that? Or are you just concentrating on your sport? What, what, what is, what's going through your mind and what are the plans? Honestly, I have no limitations in my mind. I think the world is your oyster. If you put your heart and mind to something, you can achieve it. Um, I think the next goal for me is, so obviously the book has done remarkably well in terms of the, it's grabbed the attention of, um, you know, media companies and they want to now turn that into a film. So we are currently in conversation um, to turn it into a drama series, which I'm really excited about. So looking forward to Impressive. the book becoming a film and I can play myself, possibly, um, do a Bruce Lee and Eminem. <laughs> so that is my future goal. But my main passion at the moment is boxing. I want to become a world champion because I think, you know, I want to lead the field. I don't want to be a follower. I want to make a difference. Um, and I think that's my purpose is to inspire people. Um, you know, on the, on the personal aspect of things, and I'd love to meet someone amazing and someone who truly values me and has that mutual respect and that, you know, I can support them and they can support me. So I'm not, 
ever close minded. I think I'm just I just haven't met anyone, but mm. I would love to um have that part of my life also moving parallel in terms of my personal and professional career. That's wicked. <laughs> I don't know why it popped into my mind, but I remember seeing a clip of you sparring a guy who is about to fight on August the 7th. And I don't know his name, but the reason why I know who he is is because uh -huh. I, I had a guest on mm. who is a bit of a sparring partner for me. He's pro. He's a guy called Dan Morley. Okay. And he's about to fight the guy you were sparring or doing some stuff yes, with. Lewis. Think so. August yes. the 7th. Yes, he is. Yeah. I've mm. got to tell you, Dan is looking sharp. Really? He's very, very good. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. The stories I hear from Lewis, he's... he's crazy i mean he's amazing but he's like i'm gonna knock this boy out every time he walks <laughs> into the gym so it's absolutely so much banter in the gym the energy is high um you know we have we have our little jokes and um but that's what you need in the gym you do right? you can't have it too serious it's, it's a war in there so yeah. you need to you need to have a good team around you and you just enjoy the process um so a bit of advice mm. Someone that is going through, gone through, or maybe they're about to go through it and they don't realise they're about to go through it, mm. a slight bit of depression, a slight bit of a challenging moment where you become very overwhelmed. I think more and more people are going through it because of the COVID scenario. They've yeah. been locked down. People lost their jobs. People lost their homes. Yeah. People have lost their, in some 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 respect, freedom. Mm. Um, and I think that really promotes sometimes bad outlook on life and your perspective you've gone through that so what is the kind of advice but then on the flip side yeah. you know becoming like like a, a champion at something like mm. what kind of aspects you need to work on or have in order to become that winner so we'll start with the first one yeah. like the anxiety okay. and also depression so the first one the fir the quote that comes into my mind um immediately is Every obstacle comes with a seed, equal um, seed of opportunity. And it's really interesting because when I face obstacles, I try and see, okay, what is life trying to teach me here? And then I try and switch it so I can gain an opportunity from this, this setback. Um, because whatever you're going through, there's an equal opportunity. It's the, it's the oh God, it's the... Uh, it's a law and it's um oh it's just got my head's gone blank uh the newton the isaac newton law with every oh, i'm gonna action is a reaction is it, it'll come to me later okay I, i'll find it um the cause and effect type thing it's on, along it's on those that. lines, yeah. along those lines, um, I'm trying too hard to, to find it now, but it's completely slipped my mind. Um, but yeah, there's, there's always an equal opportunity there somewhere, but you have to be able to dig deep enough to find it and turn it around. Um, and in terms of your second question. And, and so like, uh, I think that's a really, really good way and, packaging up mm -hmm. like let's say going through like challenges and it's easy for some like me to say mm -hmm. or for anyone to say when you're not going through it at the present point in time I know it can feel quite overwhelming but I think I think my take on it going back to boxing mm -hmm. it will pass so like yeah. when you're getting beaten in 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 the moment in mm -hmm. boxing or you've been hit and it, and it hurts mm -hmm. That won't last forever. You know, you can yeah. turn things around and you can you can actually use that for you rather than against you. And yeah. I think in 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 life we've gone through COVID, we've gone through lockdown, we've gone through a recession, yeah. but that doesn't last. Mm. Equally, good times don't last either. So yeah. I think you need yeah. to flourish when things are going well mm. and you need to weather the storm when things are not going so well. And I think how you get out that storm is by focusing on the right things. Yeah. And it's normally the fundamentals. Yeah. It's training right. It's right. Eating right, right, resting right, being around upbeat, positive people. Yeah. You're a pro product of your environment. Yeah. So if you spend your time around downbeat, negative, violent, aggressive individuals, you're going to become like that. Yeah. If you're around upbeat, positive, thriving, energetic, yeah. you know, cool mm -hmm. individuals, you're going to become like them. And I know it's basic, but that's what you need to do. So your next... But basics are the hardest things to do. 
Yeah. You know, people say, um, because it's easy, it's easy not to do it too. Yeah. So it's one of those things that you need to get your fundamentals right. And that sets the, the key to success, the key to life, in fact. Um, and it's so true what you've just said, you know, I mean, complete agreement that, you know, it's simple things that we, it's just choices and we need to make those choices and you can't be fearful of failure or um obstacles we yeah need to embrace it taking our stride and becoming and preparing your mind mm -hmm. and you as an individual to becoming a, a champion at whatever you're going to do what 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 kind of things can you kind of expose the audience to in regards to how to prepare their mind to prepare them as an individual to becoming a champion can i be honest um a lot of the time people think it's talent that gets you there you need a certain level of talent but you can see an average person but with elite level of thinking and perseverance will always get you somewhere. And I think this is what I've learned in my journey is that a lot of people give up on the last hurdle. Uh, just when the tide is meant to turn, they give up. Um, but if you can endure that, that's when you, that's what makes the difference. The winning and losing is 2%. You, you know what? Um, the guest I had on this morning, a guy called Ben Iron. Um, he is a street artist and he, believe it or not, he, and he doesn't look it, but he's 50 years of age yeah. and he's worked with Banksy and, you know, he's an incredible guy, very crazy. And like, there were so many interesting aspects, but when I was talking to him, I'm interested in his work, but I'm interested in his mindset. Yeah. And I've listened to some of his other interviews and when he was below 20 years of age, like 16, 17, they got in trouble with the police because graffiti is criminal damage. Yeah. You know, let's, let's have it right. And his friend said to him, do you think we're going to be doing this when we're 20? Do you think that we're going to be doing this when we're 30? Do you think we're going to be doing this when we're 40, 50? Yeah. And so many people would have boxed him into a corner, which is you're a graffiti artist, which means criminal. you're a criminal. <laughs> yes. But now he's 50. He, he, his painting is his gold and his wealth. He's literally yeah. a millionaire yeah. or could be a millionaire or very, very successful mm. because he paints now because he didn't allow someone else to say, you can't do that. You're this person and therefore yeah. you won't become a success. And your perseverance yeah. point there yeah. reminds, reminds me of the conversation I just had with him. Mm. Perseverance is like literally so important. And I think so many people get taken off their journey mm. because their own beliefs are affected by other people's beliefs of what they should be doing. Yeah. I, I think you can't be a product of other, other people's opinions because their opinions are based on their experiences their conditioning, their limitations, their fears. So you have to, you can take advice, but don't be a product of someone else's thinking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Where can people find you and where can people follow your journey, Roxana? They can follow me on Instagram. It's Roxana Begum underscore MT. I'm also on Twitter, Roxana Begum, um, Facebook, but I don't really use that very often. Okay. Um, but yeah, please read my book, Born Fighter, and I'll be delighted to receive any messages and feedbacks. Good stuff. <laughs> right. My, my question to you, which I asked last time, which is going to round off the, the episode is be happy, never content. You gave me a version of it last time. Is it the same or has it been adapted? What does be happy, never content mean to you? I think be happy is finding your purpose in life and working towards it. Once you have a goal and you're working towards it, honestly, you will have abundance of energy and enthusiasm. And that's what makes people happy. Um, and what's be happy, never content. Never content. Um, because when you're content and you're complacent, you're, you're stagnating in life. You're not reaching your true potential. Life is about adventure. Life is about challenging yourself. And that is where the reward is at. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your time. If you enjoyed this podcast, please um, share it. Please comment on the post. Please go to my YouTube channel. Also follow uh, Roxana. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely going to be some more fights. There's definitely going to be some more uh, business ventures. And there's definitely going to be a lot more entertainment. So be happy, never content. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.